Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and I'm re-wearing the Santa suit today for the remake of Silent Night, Deadly Night, released in 2012 with the cut-down title of Just Silent Night. As you well know by now, the late 2000s and early 2010s were rife with remakes and reboots, and our favorite controversial cult classic with a killer Santa Claus proved no exception to this rule. Although Silent Night is one of the less direct remakes out there, only recycling a couple of ideas and coming up with a new plot entirely. But don't worry, it is a remake, and fitting enough, the stars of this movie were in other horror remakes too. Leading the cast is Jamie King, who was in the 2009 3D remake of My Bloody Valentine, and the sheriff she reports to is played by Malcolm McDowell, who was, of course, Dr. Loomis in the Rob Zombie Halloween films. While each of the original five Silent Night films was wonderfully horrible in its own unique way, the 2012 remake is kind of standard and formulaic, but that's not to say it's unenjoyable. A good cast and some surprisingly gory kills makes for a pretty fun watch, even if the whole whodunit aspect completely falls apart at the end and, in retrospect, feels like one giant waste of time. But like I said, plenty of awesome deaths in here to enjoy. Let's say we count them. I mean, that is the hook of the show, after all. The movie begins with Up on the Housetop, an actual Christmas song as opposed to those awesome knockoffs from the original. Yeah, did I mention this movie had the biggest budget of the series? By like, a factor of five? If I didn't, it's because it's so obvious. We watch as a dude prepares a creepy custom Santa mask, while a woman, tied up on the floor, screams in terror. But the killer Santa isn't interested in her right now, and instead he goes to the basement, where a cool shot reveals there's another dude tied to a chair with Christmas lights wrapped around his head. Santa grabs his traditional Christmas axe, but it looks like it ain't time for Yule Log Chopping just yet. Instead, Deputy Jordan here is gonna get Christmas killed via electrocution. Shut up! I'm not exactly sure how this electric kill is working. I think it probably involves that metal cap he's got on there. But it's pretty cool the way the dude's skin begins to smoke and his freaking eyes burst open, reminding me of that car battery kill from part two. Just, you know, better. With our kill count begun properly, Santa heads back upstairs in another interesting shot. Nice work, director Stephen C. Miller. The town of Cryer, Wisconsin is now short one deputy. So the next day, Deputy Aubrey Brademore is woken up out of bed and told by Sheriff Cooper that she has to come in and cover for Deputy Jordan Jordan's absence, even though it's Christmas Eve. Get off your sorry ass. Town Hall's expecting a record number of Santas. It's gonna be a real clusterfuck. Damn, Cooper, sounding pretty loomy there. Aubrey doesn't want to deal with this shit since it's her first Christmas since her husband John died, but she's not about to shirk her duties, especially since her cuddly dad Hank Bradamore was a cop too, and she doesn't want to disappoint him. I am proud of you, kiddo. Oh, I like to see happy families. It's nice. Apparently, this town is a damn Santa breeding ground because they're out all over the place today. Still, I'd rather be one of those Santas than this poor beleaguered mom, Mrs. Morewood, who whose kid is a frickin' terror. Those are mommy's heart pills. I need those. You need to take me to the mall. Oh, someone's getting cold tonight, and looks like Santa's here to personally deliver it. Great salvation fucking army. But Stoop Santa ain't here for charity. He's here to take this cattle prod and fucking tase the hell out of this 14-year-old girl. What the fuck? After she gets good and frothy, he stabs her with a fire poker. And yeah, it's done off screen, but for those of you who just need to see a dead kid for verification, we see the body later when Sheriff Cooper comes over to check it out. Damn, Silent Night. You killed a kid, yeah? Aubrey gets to work, where receptionist Brenda, played by Ellen Wong, gossips with her about why exactly Deputy Jordan didn't come in today. Rumors there's a girl. Now don't go getting all jealous of that girl, Knives. Aubrey's fellow deputy, Giles, is also here, but he's a sickly slacker, so it's up to Aubrey to respond to a call about a town square Santa who's upsetting the local parents. This rogue Santa, Jim Epstein, is played by Donald Logue with his usual sardonicism. Well, to be honest, Timmy, I don't think you deserve anything this year. I love Donald Logue, even if this kid doesn't. Santa sucks. You know something? You suck! Jim Epstein is a cynical Santa from out of town who verbally spars with Aubrey until she's just about ready to shove him back up a chimney. But she gets called away by Brenda from the police station, who asks her to go check out a weird-smelling house in town. While she does that, we get a pointless scene that doesn't serve any purpose besides calling back to the original. This dude, Dennis, is visiting his catatonic grandpa at what surely must be named Wisconsin Mental Facility, when he decides to get naughty and steal from his grandpa's wallet. In response, grandpa comes to life and scares him with a lackluster will hair imitation. You better watch out, boy. 
Christmas Eve is the scariest damn night of the year. It's a pretty random scene, but to be fair, so was the one in the original, so whatever. It's for the fans. Aubrey gets over to that stinky boarded up house and traces the smell to the basement, where she finds the corpse of Deputy Jordan and promptly contaminates the crime scene. <laughs> After calling it in, she goes upstairs, where a ringing cell phone leads her into a very bloody room. She finds the ringing phone in a drawer, with a hand still clutching it. But for all you completists out there, don't worry. The rest of the body's pieces are here too. I, I think. Might be a toe or something is missing? This hacked up corpse belongs to the woman tied up in the beginning. A married woman named Alana Roach, who was having an affair with Deputy Jordan. Sounds like they were being naughty and needed some punishment. Sheriff Cooper arrives at the house, so Malcolm McDowell can ham it up some more. Hell, he even gets his own. Deputy Dewey-like, western-sounding leitmotif. So don't go playing the hero. That's my job. In an earlier scene with Cryer's elected leader, Mayor Revy, we learn that the small town only has one road. This town will die if we don't put another road in. And now we find out that it's currently closed due to weather, so the Cryer Police Department isn't gonna get any help from outside sources for this case. Cooper's just fine with that, though, because he's ready to be a super sheriff. This sick fuck is gonna wish he never set foot in my town. Elsewhere in this sleepy, snowy town, there's some softcore porn being shot in a motel room. And when I say this place is snowy, I mean it is snowy. After the blonde model Tiffany, who happens to be the mayor's daughter, leaves the motel with her photo shoot cash, the rest of these smutrepreneurs get a visit from the world's nastiest looking Santa Claus. He immediately murders this woman Goldie with a scythe that he's holding, by swinging it up right through her stomach and giving us a good long look at her as she bleeds out her mouth and dies. Model Maria, played by Zombiever's Courtney Palm, makes an immediate dash for the bathroom, but photographer Frank is slow to react, and for his lethargy, he gets that scythe right in the crotch. Frank actually manages to survive long enough to distract the killer Santa with a gunshot, which allows Maria to begin an escape out the second story window. He's ultimately killed off screen, but way to make your last moments count, Frank. When the Santa comes back, he scares Maria straight out the window, and she falls through the air right into a bunch of trash bags. Wow, good thing it wasn't garbage day! The Santa and his Christmas acts chase Maria into a Christmas tree grove, where the spruce selection would make Clark Griswold cry. When the masked killer inevitably catches up to the topless girl, he begins the kill by hacking off her leg, which sends it flying through the air. He grabs Maria and takes her over to a wood chipper, and before you can say Steve Buscemi, he shoves her into the machine. Wow, man, this movie cranked it up to 11 real fucking fast. The police are informed of the day's crimes, so Cooper goes and comforts the mom of the little dead girl, while Aubrey and Giles tend to the bodies at the porn shoot motel room. Porn, drugs, when did this town become so sleazy? In the room, they also find a video camera that's been recording the whole time. What a juicy clue. They review the footage at the police station, like we haven't seen Courtney Palm topless enough already, and discover that the killer Santa is a regular goddamn bagool. <laughs> Tiffany, the model slash mayor's daughter, is singing in the town square in a quintet of Santa girls. But why even bother with those outfits if you ain't doing Jingle Bell Rock while Amy Poehler videotapes you? They get hit on by pervy pastor Reverend Maidley, who had earlier hit on Aubrey when she swung through a church to mourn her dead husband. And lest you think all his shoulder gripping and salivating is innocent, nah son. Spread some joy to the world. To further cement his sliminess, we see him stealing from the collection basket. This guy's just asking to get punished. And what do you know? Here comes his judge, jury, and executioner. After Maidley tries to get all Jonathan Edwards on his congregation of one elderly woman, there's a great awakening in the Santa's desire to kill. So he takes out a hunting knife and promptly cuts off the pastor's fingers? Holy shit! He then shanks the dude in the belly a straight dozen times, killing Reverend Maidley at the foot of his own pews. The only witness to the murder promises to stay quiet quiet as a church mouse. I won't say a word. And the murder Santa agrees that silence is golden and lets her live. The police department is out looking for a killer Santa now, and Aubrey thinks she has a lead when she spots a sort of Michael Emerson looking Saint Nick at a bar. Looking like Ben Linus is PC enough, but this dude Stein Carson also happens to live at the porn shoot motel. As he and Aubrey talk about the holidays, he goes into a flashback story. But unlike the flashbacks in the rest of this series, this one consists of new footage and new information. The story he tells is of a jealous, jaded husband named Ronald Jones, who dressed as Santa and took a homemade flamethrower out for a spin one Christmas night. And he said about killing them that was not. The desaturated flashback shows how Ronald Jones scared away his wife's boyfriend before turning the weapon on her and firing away. Jane Jones burned to death in the street, reminding me of the falling flaming lady death from part four initiation, just, you know, better. After Carson's story time is over, Aubrey calls the last number in a phone she found at the porn shoot crime scene 
and it happens to go to Carson's phone. He flips out and runs away from her, and after she chases him out back to the alleyway, he gives her a Santa sucker punch and knocks her to the ground. He even slashes her with a knife before Cooper arrives and scares the dude away. Aubrey calls her pops and tells him that she's lost confidence in herself as a cop. And it's a nice little character scene between the daddy and daughter as he assures her that she's the best damn police he's ever seen. It's funny how this Silent Night is like trying to be an actual movie. Hank ends the phone call, promising her that she'll succeed. This isn't the first time a Bradamore had to bring down a bad Santa. Don't forget that four years ago, I had to put 16 rounds in Billy Bob Thornton. Oh, that Billy Bob. Cooper is convinced that Carson is their man. It's double S. Is it? Carson, it's double S. Double S. Double screwed. But even though Carson attacked her, Aubrey still thinks it might be someone else. While looking through the, what, the case files or whatever, she sees some information that leads her to believe it's Jim Epstein. You know, Donald Logue. Mm. Ooh, now I'm scared. So she and Cooper break into his trailer, which, say what you will, at least he's fucking festive. But they're looking in the wrong place. The Santa killer has arrived at the mayor's stately home, acts all already to register a complaint with the city. The mayor himself is out back smoking a cigarette when his wild child Tiffany arrives, already undressing her boyfriend Dennis, that one dude from the grandpa scene. The two of them stumble off to go open up some presents in the guest house, leaving Mayor Revy all by his lonesome. He gets a call from Sheriff Cooper, but mid-conversation, finds a strand of Christmas lights inconveniently wrapped around his neck. Yeah, this is the third time this kill has gone down in this franchise, and it's pretty much the same as before. And Cooper's such an idiot, he just mistakes the mayor's sounds of struggles as bad reception. The mayor's bomb-ass guest house is all ready to host some more sex and gore for us, since Tiffany and Dennis are in there making the same old tired Christmas climax jokes. It looks like Santa's gonna come early this year. Before he can blow his chimney stack, though, Dennis gets shut out of the room while checking out a noise, and the killer Santa Anna cuts Tiffany's escape short by throwing his axe at her Achilles tendon. Yeah, she ain't coming back from that one. To pay proper homage to Linnea Quigley, Santa impales Tiffany on the horns of a mounted animal skull, giving us some updated makeup effects on the classic kill that was easily one of the most memorable parts of the original film. Dennis finally gets back in the room, only to find Tiffany's body on the wall and an axe in his back. He turns around to face his Santa attacker, and you know what? The kill here is actually so graphic and intense that I can't show it in the public version of this video. Sorry y'all, I'm just trying to stay off YouTube's naughty list. But boy, was that kill nasty. You know, like in a great way. The police head to the town's Santa parade, where they've got suspects aplenty spreading all sorts of Santa cheer. But for Aubrey, one Mr. Claus in particular stands out. Watch it, buddy. Fake ass Santas. It's Jim Epstein, and Aubrey chases him through a sea of Santas so she can catch her man. Cooper's the one who ultimately subdues Epstein with his handy dandy nightstick, and they lock him in a jail cell where he screams for his favorite holiday snack. Where's my piggy pudding? That was actually part of a like three minute rant about how Christmas is a miserable time. And for some reason, by the end of it, Aubrey no longer believes that Jim Epstein is the killer behind the beard. She heads back to the murder motel where she witnesses Stein Carson being shady. She walks into his room with her gun already drawn, and it doesn't take long for him to pull out his own piece. He's confident she won't actually shoot him, but when his finger gets itchy, he's proven wrong, and she puts a slug right in the middle of his forehead, killing him quickly and spraying blood all over that kitchen. I mean, it's not like it was super clean before or anything, but still, someone's gonna have to wipe that shit up. Then, I'ma be real, the movie starts to lose me here by trying to be too smart with its clues and twists. Aubrey sees a present on Carson's counter, and has flashbacks to seeing similarly wrapped gifts at the various crime scenes from throughout the day. She also remembers seeing one of them at home with her dad, so she rushes back home in a worried hurry. Turns out there's also one of those presents at the police station. A lump of coal? Not a good sign for the cops there, including Giles, who was just about to check out for the night. A random line from Sheriff Cooper, hey, And take the trash while you're at it! Leads to a direct reference to Eric Freeman's tour de force performance from part two. What is this? Garbage day? Honestly, I would have liked the reference more without the very obvious line, but you know what, whatever. Give the people what they want, I guess. Giles is killed after peeking into the window of a car in the parking lot and getting an axe swung straight into his face. His eyes, if you want to be specific about it. Which I do, because, you know, it's kind of my job. The lights are cut at the police station, casting everything there in Suspiria tones, and it's under these blood-red lights that Murder Santa shows up and uses his flamethrower to light up Sheriff Cooper. It's kind of unbelievable, but that is in fact Malcolm McDowell's death. I guess you could say it's supposed to be anticlimactic after all of his big chest puffery, but it still would have been nice to see a more exciting kill for the man. Aubrey gets home and finds her dad sitting in a chair with his back to her. As you probably expected, Papa Hank Bradamore is already dead, having been
been totally eviscerated. Aw, oh, man. I really like that dude. And the relationship he had with his daughter. Sad death, especially for Aubrey to discover. See? Look how sad she is. She finds her mother, thankfully still alive, tied up in a closet. And after promising to get revenge for her papa, she leaves. At the police station, Brenda manages to hide herself in a closet while the murder Santa scrapes his axe down a hallway looking for her. Instead, he finds Jim Epstein locked inside the jail cell. And after freeing the innocent curmudgeon, they get into a Santa spat. Fuck you. Fuck Christmas. And fuck your plastic face! Not nice. Oh man, you don't want to be the first person Murder Santa talks to. That means you're gonna get extra killed. Epstein tries to put up a fight, but Santa gets him to the ground and takes out some holiday brass knuckles, with which he beats the guy's head in until it sounds like he's boxing with a watermelon. Aubrey gets to the police station, where the fire sprinklers are going off thanks to Cooper's burnt head. Murder Santa leaps out and attacks her, and their fight turns into an axe battle, which would be really cool if I could just see what the hell was happening in it. Aubrey ultimately triumphs over the Murder Santa by taking his homemade flamethrower and lighting him up like he's some of Nellie's hot shit. The Santa goes down, down baby to the floor, and Aubrey leaves him there burning as she goes and rescues Brenda from the closet. Together, the two of them make it outside and watch as the crier police station goes up in flames. Some some time later, we see a dude with a big burn on his face sitting in a truck and glancing at an old family photo. It's here that we get our perfunctory explanation as to who the killer Santa was. It was Ronald Jones Jr., son of the angry flashback Santa, Ronald Jones Sr. You know, the dude who torched his wife. Turns out that after that happened, Aubrey's dad Hank rolled up. And remember how he said it wasn't the first time a Bradamore had to put down a bad Santa? That's cause Hank shot Ronald Jones Sr. and caused his flamethrower to explode all over him. Ronald Jones Sr. died in a slow motion immolation, falling to the ground right next to the wife he had burned to death moments prior. And that's what we call karma, son. Oh, speaking of sons, yeah, turns out Ronald Jones Jr. had been sitting in his dad's truck and witnessed the whole thing. It led him to become the movie's murder Santa this year, and I guess he survived the fire. Merry Christmas? Kind of lost me at the end there, but maybe this bloody remake can bring me back on board by putting up big numbers. Let's get to them. Oh, hey Santa, I'm Santa too. Do you wanna- Santa? No, Santa! No, Santa, no! Tusty! Ah! 17 people died in Silent Night, the most of the entire series. There were 11 male victims and 6 female victims, including one 14-year-old girl, which you just don't see that often. Usually, a character's at least 16 before they become slasher fodder. With a runtime of 94 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 5.53 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Dennis. Sorry that I can't show it in the public version, but that thing splits in two like a capital Y. And holy shit, man, it is gnarly as fuck. Clear winner. Dahl Machete for lamest kill can go to Mayor Revy. The third time is not the charm on the Christmas light strangling kill. If you're gonna do the same thing again, go big or go home. And that's it. The soft remake, Silent Night, came out in 2012 and is one of the better remakes I've seen since it actually tried to be its own movie while still paying proper homage to the original. Tomorrow is my final Christmas kill count, and judging by all the comments asking for it, it's probably the movie you want me to cover for a change. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Pratchett Agarwal and Justin Griggs. I also want to thank some patrons who have been with me for over a year, people like Kyle Elizabeth Huck, Mikey K, Kenneth Miller, and Becky Richards. Personally, these were some of my favorite episodes, so I hope you were able to enjoy them too. I've got one more Christmas Kill Count for you, and that comes out tomorrow. Thanks everyone, be good people.